I'm just delighted to be here with you as we come toward the close of a beautiful summer and a very active one. Just before I left the house, I saw a whole group of students kneeling with candles on the campus at Gainesville, where three girls have been killed and mutilated, another one killed, and a, and a man killed. And that's my topic for tonight. It won't matter what the Supreme Court says about prayer on school campuses. When people feel like praying, they're going to pray. And uh, I was asked just to speak tonight on this subject, which has suddenly come up here in Utah because um, at our graduation exercises, a lot of the young people were very concerned that the ACLU did not want anyone to pray in their graduation exercises as though it was the ACLU graduating, not them. And they felt quite incensed about it. Um, so all of a sudden, it, it, this has come up in, in a big hurry. And there's some aspects of it, some angles of it, I thought maybe you'd be interested in. <clears throat> I picked out uh, all these articles out of one paper, just one paper, uh, all on the fact that they're indignant about this problem of not being allowed to pray in public, etc. It was on the K Talk show as I was coming over. ACLU was trying to explain their position. And um, I, I understand some of these people who not only don't like prayer in public, but use any excuse to gradually um, phase it out because they have a, an end antipathy toward communications with our Heavenly Father. There are others who are sincerely concerned about the legal aspects of it. But I just want, want, to, want to read just a few little lines out of some of these. I'm an 18-year-old girl who just graduated from Granite High School in June. I was very angered when I heard the report on the ACLU taking Granite and Alpine districts to court for including graduation prayers in their ceremonies. The ACLU claims that graduation prayer is a violation of the Constitution. How can they possibly reach that conclusion when the Constitution in no way says anything about the separation of church and state? All the Constitution says is that, quote, Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. How can this simple statement possibly be construed to mean that a brief prayer, prayer cannot be offered at high school graduation? That's her question. Uh, the Constitution does, however, guarantee the freedom of speech. And how can ACLU misconstrue freedom of speech to include the burning of a country's flag while saying it prohibits the offering of a little prayer? <laughs> As an 18-year-old girl, she's kind of upset about all of this. And um, here's an, another one, just a couple of sentences from it. I will be a senior at uh, Bingham High School next year. Recently, the American Civil Liberties Union has announced its intention to sue school districts for praying at graduation. I would implore the ACLU to leave us alone. We aren't looking for a judicial fight. We're looking for religious freedom and the right to acknowledge our Creator. I will fight for Bingham's right to have a graduation prayer. And let's see one, one other maybe here. Uh, if, if a graduation ceremony is a celebration of human achievement, what kind of arrogance would refuse to acknowledge the God who gave us life and enables us to think, write, and speak? Those who are offended by the sincere prayers of others in any setting betray the shallowness of their own spiritual nature and their ignorance of the religious foundation of human law and government. Such people are to be pitied, not indulged. And fourth and finally, seems to me that if the ACLU should win its suits and stop prayers in schools, then they would be doing to everyone else the very thing that they are crying has been done to them. They have been forced to listen to prayers against their will. But a ban against any prayers at any school function would then force the way of the ACLU on everybody else. The ACLU demands for rights goes the other way around. 
The ACLU doesn't need it all the way. They're just one of the groups in our many faceted society, and they should be satisfied to have their fair share and not demand any more. <laughs> I got some more. But this was all on, on one editorial page of the Deseret News, August the 15th, 1990. And um, I had just come back from a trip, and my wife says, you know, uh, your topic that you're supposed to speak on Thursday night's a pretty hot subject. <laughs> well, it has aroused a lot of feeling. Do you know that we prayed in school for 170 years after the First Amendment was adopted, before anyone ever questioned the fact that we shouldn't be praying in school on account of the First Amendment? That kind of interesting. Now, <clears throat> I thought it might be interesting tonight, uh, before I go into some of the technical aspects of it and what we can do about it, or what probably will happen. There isn't much that will be done about it right away. Ultimately, though, there will. Um, who do you think is objecting to prayer in schools? It's, a, it's an interesting group. We all know about the ACLU, but it's only one of several activist groups that are very anxious to eliminate this communication with God in public. For example, we have the American Atheist Association, which was the first one to win a case uh, against the schools having a Bible reading, and uh, that was under the direction of Madeline Murray O'Hare, if you remember. I think that's her last married name. She gets several as she goes along. Quite a gal, really. And uh, uh, the, the boy that she pulled out of school because he had to listen to a Bible, uh, to a prayer and Bible reading in the Baltimore schools is now grown up and become a minister. <laughs> so she grabbed her younger son named John and sent him all over the country challenging people to debate on atheism. And um, there is no God and so forth. I got a telephone call from the university and they said, we're really embarrassed. We have um, uh, John Murray coming and he's going to talk. And we've called all the churches, we've called the universities, we've called the departments of psychology and philosophy. We can't get anybody to meet him. <laughs> And uh, somebody ought to meet him. I mean, he shouldn't be allowed to come into Salt Lake City of all places and just say there is no God and not have somebody say, well, yes, there is. <laughs> anyway, reminded me of being back in Boston at the time, you know, when everybody was saying God is dead. And a lot of young people at university thought that was great stuff. And so they're wearing these big badges. God is dead. God is dead. And I had a suit with wide lapels, so I put a big badge under my lapel. And when one of them had come up and flashed his badge, God is dead, I'd flash mine, which said, my God is alive, sorry about yours. <laughs> 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 anyway, John, uh, John came and, and we had our little, our little debate on television. Just a young fellow, he's only about 19 or so, and, uh, and, uh, I had told him I wouldn't debate, but I will discuss. I'll be very glad to discuss. And so I asked him if he'd ever read John Locke. No, he wasn't sure he'd heard of John Locke. And I said, well, you'd enjoy him because he has a whole chapter in his, in his essay on human behavior in which he says, everybody can know there is a God. And I said, John, would you like to know there is a God? We'll do it right here on TV. And all you have to do is talk to your brain. Because your brain knows there's a God, John. Have you ever talked to your brain about God? <laughs> we had a good time. Anyway, uh, I, I said, now, you see, if there's no God, that means everything happened by accident. Doesn't it? Oh, yes, yes, it all happened by accident over eons of time, with all the forces of nature working one on another. Yes, that's what it means. I said, now, John, that's a very interesting deduction, because if you're going to justify everything that exists 
to just accidental accumulations of forces of nature working on another, I want you to talk to your brain for a minute. And here's my watch. And I want you to say, brain, do you think that in all the eons of time, with all the forces working on one another, things freezing, volcanoes exploding, galaxies disappearing, and, and then coming back, do you think that it would produce a watch, brain? Now, John, talk to your brain. Accidentally? Well, he said, no, not a watch. I said, that's the right answer. Right in John Locke. Now, that's the right answer. I want you to get answer, ask your brain this. If it wouldn't produce a watch, why wouldn't it? Accidentally. Why wouldn't it produce a watch accidentally? Well, he says, you know, it's intelligent design and high precision engineering, you know. That, Now, I have to ask you the question that Mr. Locke would ask you if he were here. What about your eye? One thing missing and you're blind. What about that fantastic little arrangement that's in your ear? Uh, the, with the stirrups and the anvil, all beautifully arranged so you can hear a symphony and the birds singing. And what about your digestive tract, John? You know, it's amazing what you put down there and what it handles and everything comes in about the right time and everything. And isn't it a good thing your esophagus goes to your stomach and not your lungs? <laughs> I don't know how about you, but if I get something done, <laughs> if I get anything in my lungs, I'm, I'm gone for the night. Anyway, <laughs> it was interesting to watch him. He, he was just an innocent, wonderful boy. And as we talked along, he began admitting, yeah, maybe that's possible. I said, you see, the great thing about it, John, you are not an accident. You're a wonderful person with a brain, a marvelous system, all working together. You're better than a watch. I mean, you're, 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 you represent 10,000 watches with all of them going according to a DNA pattern by a wise, intelligent, heavenly Father who loves you. You think about that, John, because your, your brother found out about it. And he's out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and enjoying it. I've talked to him. And I think you'd enjoy it. You, you think about that. I'll see you right after the broadcast. We'll visit some more about some of these things. <laughs> While they whisked him away, he had two men with him. Man, they got him out of that studio so fast, I didn't have a chance to give him a book or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I had two or three things I was going to give him, but anyway... <laughs> But um, this business of prayer was very close to our founding fathers, extremely close to our founding fathers. And the editor of a magazine um, recently wrote an article, Haven Bradford Gow. I want to just read a little bit. He says, in the making of America, it was nice to have a good book quoted, uh, <laughs> it observes that Quote, Americans of the 20th century often fail to realize the supreme importance which the Founding Fathers originally attached to the role of religion in the unique experiment which they hoped would emerge as the first civilization of free people in modern times. Many Americans also fail to realize that the Founders felt the role of religion would be as important in our day as it was in theirs. This is all a quote. In 1787, the very year the Constitution was written by the Convention and approved by Congress, that same body of Congress passed the famous Northwest Ordinance. In it, they outlawed slavery in the Northwest Territory. They enunciated the basic rights of citizens in language that was similar to that which was later incorporated in the Bill of Rights. And they emphasized the essential need to teach religion and morality in the schools. Now, of course, if you're going to teach religion in the schools, you immediately ask yourself, whose religion? Whose religion are they going to teach? And the founders had a beautiful answer, the American religion. It took me two years to find out what they were talking about. Sometimes they'd answer that question, the American religion. Sometimes they'd say the universal religion. 
and it really stymied me for a while. First I found Franklin defining what the American religion was and what we want taught in the schools. And you've heard me enunciate these things before, but first of all, he said it's very important to recognize the existence of God who deserves our expressions of appreciation and our worship. Secondly, we should recognize that he has revealed a pattern for happy living with a system of morals to distinguish right from wrong. Number three, he holds us responsible for the way we tr treat each other. And number four, we live beyond this life. And number five, in the next life, we're judged for all the things we did in this life that we didn't get forgiveness for. Those five things we want to teach in all the schools. Uh, do Catholics believe those five things? Presbyterians? And Methodists? You can go right down the line. That's not all. How about Mohammedans? How about Muslims? How about um, Hussein over there? He hasn't read it lately, you know, but it's in his book. <laughs> Man, how about the Hindus? And how about the Buddhists? You're talking about the great universal things that Franklin said belongs to all sound religion. That's what they want to taught in the schools. Nobody can be offended by that unless they're atheists. And they didn't have much pity for atheists. They hadn't talked to their brain lately, you know, like John Locke said to do. Anyway, and I'll read a little bit more of this after a while, but um, he picked out of the, th of the making of America this uh, whole section out of the First Amendment discussion, which has an interesting history. Uh, it's a copy of a speech. Under the First Amendment, I have a copy of a speech that I gave at the University of Utah Law School. The students asked one of their professors if, if, if he would invite me to come up and speak. And uh, when he invited me, I was kind of surprised because we have a little different perspective on the Constitution. But I said, sure, I'll come up. And um, I told them the history of the Founding Fathers' appreciation of the necessity for protecting religion from the government. Just don't let it get its talons in there, its fangs into religion, and let the people work it out themselves just how they want to have their religious expression um, organized, presented. I spoke for about 45 minutes and that gave about 10 minutes for questions. And uh, there were no questions. Uh, I said, I, 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 know, I know I couldn't have made it that clear. Surely you have some questions. Very quiet. That really puzzled me. Afterwards, one of the students said, you know, the professor gave us six questions to ask you. Six of us had questions. They were trick questions. But you answered them already. And none of us knew what to ask. <laughs> because we'd have sounded like fools if we would have asked them, because you covered them. And I said, well, um, why do you call them trick questions? He said, because the way they were worded, no matter how you would have answered them, uh, it, it might have sounded a little foolish. But after you had given the historical background and everything, the question didn't even make sense. I mean, you'd already dealt with it, and so I didn't want to ask mine, and I guess the others didn't want to ask theirs either. Anyway, it was a great experience, and those students were just great. And afterwards, we had a, a little visit together and had some lunch together. They were just loaded with, with questions. Anyway, um, that talk uh, and the points that I was trying to make on the First Amendment are, are contained in, in your making of America. It's interesting that not until 1947, nobody thought of challenging uh, the, the religion in the schools such as it was or prayers in the schools. Nobody thought of challenging it. But in 1947, they did. I'll just mention a, uh, a, a couple of them. The 
court was asked whether or not it would violate the Constitution, these are some of the questions that began to emerge, if um, the state of New Jersey paid for the transport, the transportation, the bus fare for children going to the, uh, the um, Catholic schools. And the court said no, because you have to pay for their transportation to a school somewhere, and the children are required to go to school, no, you, you should be paying their bus fare. Wasn't that a nice one? But that introduced the subject, and it gave the court a chance to make the biggest mistake it could possibly have made by dividing the First Amendment into two parts on religion. Because it says um, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. They said that's one part all by itself. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, that's another part. The founders said, no, it was all one thing. We didn't want religion to be violated on the local level uh, by the government. It's all the same thing. An establishment of religion, as you know, is, a, is an official state religion. And so if they had put one more word in, it might have made it a little more clear, because it's all in their writings and speeches. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or otherwise prohibiting the free exercise thereof. See, that would have put it together. And scholars since that time have indicated that that really would have been helpful. Now, as they proceeded down the track, uh, the, the court on several occasions allowed free textbooks to go to the uh, parochial schools. Uh, see, this is, or private schools. You have to furnish books and they have to be examined out of those books. It doesn't matter whether it's a state school or whether it's a private school or parochial school, church school. They are entitled to those books and they're entitled to them free. Well, you know, as I saw those cases unfolding, I thought, this is going to turn out all right. But by 1962, things were beginning to turn. And that's when we had this little boy in Baltimore uh, ha pulled out of school because he had to sit there and listen to a prayer. Well, let me just uh, get back here now quickly to, to um, our prayer in schools because once they had eliminated Bible reading and prayer from the, from the schools per se, um, we went on down the trail a little ways and finally the, the nature of the court began to shift and right now it's beginning to move over so we are very close to having somebody or having enough, let me put it that way, having enough who believe in the traditional values of America so that we might get a lot of these things turned around. And we've got lawyers just standing by, just waiting for a good, substantial majority of the Supreme Court to represent traditional American views. And you're going to see a whole lot of dominoes fall, in my estimation. I, I feel good about the way the, the trend is, is going. Please. I just want to uh, read a summary of this article by this editor from back east as he closes out his, his little article because it demonstrates how ludicrous these holdings of the Supreme Court have been in recent years where they have denigrated some of these activities we have in our schools, reading the Bible, saying our prayers, etc. He said, many opponents of prayer in the public schools base their opposition on the argument the Constitution demands a strict and total separation of church and state, but their view is contradicted by the following historical facts. Public prayer and the acknowledgement of a supreme being have been an important part of American life from the very beginning. The Declaration of Independence affirms that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Our National Pledge of Allegiance proclaims us as one nation under God. Our coins are inscribed with the words, in God we trust. Prayer remains an integral part of many government functions and institutions, sessions of Congress, and many state legislatures open with prayer. Each branch of the military retains chaplains and maintains chapels and hymn books for use of servicemen and service women. The president-elect takes the oath of office with his hand on the Bible and says, so help me God. 
The standard form for oaths for sworn testimony contains the, frames, the phrase, so help me God. Each new session of the U.S. Supreme Court opens with this declaration. It's kind of interesting. Uh, after all the Supreme Court has done, and uh, when I was admitted to the Supreme Court, I noticed that as the court is open, uh, they, uh, they have the man stand up and say, God save the United States and this honorable court. <laughs> I said, Amen, real loud. <laughs> now, uh, I, I thought Rabbi Siegel had a, an interesting thing to say. He said, um, he's a teacher of theology and ethics at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Quote, it hardly seems logical that the very convention that crafted the Constitution would have viewed with favor the elimination of prayer from public schools when it decreed that its own daily sessions commence with a request for divine assistance and blessings. I thought that was good. And let's see, he commented on it. These facts serve to buttress the claim, as Rabbi Siegel observes, Whatever the meaning of the First Amendment, which prohibits the establishment of religion, it certainly did not mean the separation of religion from the public institutions and functions. When uh, Jefferson was tutoring Madison, Madison was eight years younger than he was, uh, he said, this is such an easier system to administer. It's so much fairer. It's so much, so, so, it's more just. Uh, Jefferson, for example, when you read your Making of America, um, he said, now I want, we want to be sure that uh, at the University of Virginia, there is an opportunity for the young people to be taught the religion of their choice. We want to have the ministers there. We want them to even come in and uh, use the classrooms to teach the ones that belong to their particular church. We want to do everything that we can to make religion easy for them. And uh, these are the men that, they, that we keep hearing, you see, we're so strict about separating uh, church and state. He set the whole University of Virginia up so they could teach religion to those who were interested and choose the person who is of, a professor who is of their particular uh, faith. Um, he was so happy with the fact that the um, courthouse at Charlottesville, which is the nearest town, to, was being used by four separate churches. And he says they take turn, and I think it's doing them a lot of good to hear one another's gospel. <laughs> he, he, why, that would no more be allowed today in fact, the court said that you could have release time just so they don't study religion in the school. You'll remember that. He says, there is not a shadow of right in the general government to intermeddle with religion and its least interference with it would be a most flagrant usurpation. And then he talked, um, there's a lot of good uh, uh, comments here about um, why he wanted uh, religious instructions in the schools. He said, uh, this is the way we're going to set it up in our, uh, in our university. The responsibility for teaching the proofs of the being of a God, the creator, preserver, and supreme ruler of the universe, the author of all relations of morality and of the laws and obligations they infer, will be by our professor of ethics. Isn't that nice? He says, number two, if the university faculty will also teach the development of these moral obligations of those in which all sects agree, see, that's what I told you a minute ago about these are the great universal principles of religion, uh, they, sh they must have a knowledge of Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, and then there's the Vulgate, which is the Latin version of the Old Testament, in order to bring together all of those who, f who share common ideals. And number three, we must encourage the different religious sections to establish each for itself a professorship in their own tenets, uh, or of their own tenets, on the confines of the university campus. They're going to have it right on campus. 
so that their students may attend the lecture there and have the free use of our library. And number four, enable the students of the university to attend religious exercises with the professor of their particular uh, sect. And number five, which is the last, urge the students to participate in regular religious exercises, but do so without conflicting with the established schedule of the university. Uh, should the religious sects of this state or any of them according to the invitation held out to them established within or adjacent to the pre precincts of the university schools for instruction in the religion of their sect the students of the university will be free and expected to attend religious worship at the establishment of their respective sect now you're you're listening now to a really great spiritual giant and i just wanted to kind of close on that note